Um, we're going to start off today with a panel entitled Silver Lining, Finding a Creative Letterpress Teaching Strategy During Lockdown. I'm going to be the moderator for this session, but since this is a pre-foreign panel whose members have collaborated on their plans for the panel um, for their presentations, all this means is that I will just be giving them a five minute warning at the very end of the session, which is going to end at 1245 Eastern Standard Time. Each presenter will introduce themselves at the start of their presentation. Um, and I just want to remind everyone to keep themselves on mute during the presentation so we don't have any background noise. So I'm going to pass it over now to Kathy Ruggie Saunders to get us started with the slides. How does that look? Great. I think Can you see it? Yes. yes. Okay. Good morning from Chicago. Thank you for joining us for our panel, Silver Lining, Finding a Creative Letterpress Strategy During the Lockdown. And thank you to the CBAA for inviting us to share what we've learned. Our panel is comprised of myself, Kathy Ruggie Saunders, an adjunct professor at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago for nearly 40 years. My colleague, Martha Chipless, an adjunct assistant professor there for 15 years, and two alums from SAIC, Mint Liu and Dave Chviak. Mm -hmm. Both Mint and Dave were both presenters at PIP's print futures at different times. So they're very accustomed to um, speaking remotely like this. Martha and I will pre present first and then Mitt and Dave will offer comments. Whoops, hold on a sec. It's not, there it is. Thanks. We all had to rise to the creative challenge that the coronavirus placed in our carefully planned paths. If we looked at it as an opportunity to re-envision ourselves and our work together, we discovered media, concepts, and ourselves in ways we would have not done otherwise. COVID-19 might have offered us as makers the most profound opportunity for expression we have encountered in our lifetime. And certainly we have an obligation to make art in times of crisis. Artists and designers before us have experienced war, disease, political upheaval, catastrophic weather, and their art endures. It was definitely our time to contribute to the great and uncertain future that we share. The letterpress studio was assessed by the facilities department at the school to accommodate social distancing restrictions, as you can see in this floor plan. Normally our cap for the class is 12 students, but it was reduced to six. And of course, masks were the order of the day. I found that there were significant similarities and contrasts to make regarding the practice of letterpress and the global pandemic that engulfed us. A studio class like Letterpress Bookworks emphasizes a hands-on approach. Stemming the coronavirus required a hands-off approach. No handshakes, no hugs, stay six feet away from other people. Letterpress most often focuses upon making an addition, multiples, the strategy to lessen the virus, however, was to limit its multiplication. For all of us that love to run our fingers across an impression, our fingers were now often gloved. Up to midterm of March 2020, we became familiar with this relief process of printing. But the life that was familiar to us before the virus would certainly have been a relief to have back again. Students at SAIC investigated the relationship between these aspects and more 
creating a print or book without using the standard equipment of our course's studio practice, meaning presses, ink, metal type, etc. After all, normal was out and a new normal was in. This presentation will share their results. Oops, sorry, there. These are the prompts that I gave my students in the form of questions. Prompt number one, how could you create a print or a book that we cannot touch or shouldn't touch? Perhaps it could be contained in a test tube. What would be the repercussions if we took it out of that test tube? The image you see on your screen is courtesy of Kay Hines, which I found online after I gave out this prompt to my students. Prompt number two, our fingerprint is a print, but we must practice social distancing and not touch each other during the pandemic. How can one express the immediacy and tactility of handling a book without doing so? What if you created a print at arm's length, like how people took selfies with a selfie stick? Prompt number three, lockdown and quarantine are now very familiar words in our vocabulary. How can they be brought into a relief printmaking conversation. Lockdown suggests applying pressure, as in pulling a print. On a field trip to the special collections at the Harold Washington Library in Chicago, we saw clasped books from the Middle Ages. What if we contemporize that notion to a book that is truly locked down and can't be opened? How could you make visible a quarantined print? Is it a print behind glass? Is it an image way off in the corner of a huge format? Prompt number four, COVID-19 is marked by fever, coughing, shortness of breath. What would those symptoms look like as a visual vocabulary? If the virus enters the body through one's respiratory system, how could the composition of the print reflect that? What would a book marked by these symptoms look like? And prompt number five, have you heard the silence outside since there are few people and vehicles on the streets? Could you create an audio print that speaks to the coronavirus? What would it sound like, look like? Students could choose among these ideas or others of their own making. They created mock-ups in a media of their choice and checked in with me via email and Zoom. I gave them four weeks to complete the project. The following is documentation of three of those final projects. And I will be reading portions of the students' artist statements as I speak about them. Emily Jing created a book entitled People Not Numbers. It's four by six inches, and it discusses the critical nature of COVID-19 at that time. All the pages are printed with a self-constructed clay ball with shattered glass protrusions to represent the look of the coronavirus. Emily then dipped the ball in ink and rolled it across her sequenced pages. Starting from the first page, there are only several black dots representing the total confirmed cases of COVID, and a few of the red dots representing the total number of deaths. As the reader flips the pages, the movement of those dots becomes more aggressive and eventually could take up the whole page. This book is not designed to be fully opened. The reader will always be restricted 
just as in those news photos you might remember where we saw families saying goodbye through train and nursing home windows. As the number of confirmed cases went up each day, Emily said she was accepting this norm in an unacceptable way. She started to forget that behind those numbers, individuals and families were suffering. Quote, they are people whom others love. This book was made to tell everyone behind those cold stone numbers, there are people with warm blood and soul. Those are people, not numbers, end quote. Shia Shan Lu did a book entitled Washing Off. Washing hands is one of the fundamental necessities in a letterpress studio to provide a clean operating environment. Washing hands is also a significant method to remove the COVID-19 virus. However, compared with inks, viruses are invisible, scattered everywhere. This project performed as a discussion of the post-work, after-work process of letterpress and our daily life Find, fighting the pandemic. The book consisted of several parts, the cover, a loose silver clip, and non-fixed pages. The gradient strip on the front cover mimics the water flow, and the scattered fading alphabets represent the ink and viruses that are washed off. The silver clip is a symbol of a typical water faucet, indicating that opening the book is equivalent to walking over to the sink. Carefully placed upside down capital U's are used for symbolizing hands. The first two pages are transparent black plastic, indicating the visible dirtiness. As you page through the book or wash your hands, the pages become clearer. Readers come to an almost blank page, but actually the virus in invisible ink will still show itself under ultraviolet light, just like in a scientific examination. Eventually readers will regain a clean pair of hands and hopefully safety. Rika Sabo's book is entitled Six Feet. Rika wrote, during this time, people all over the world are instructed to say, stay six feet away from each other. Just a few months ago, being close to people was a normal part of everyday life. So what happens when you suddenly need to increase the distance from someone you love. This is the difficult issue my project addresses. I designed a measuring tape that is exactly six feet long. And on it, I recorded the distances between two people in a romantic relationship during day-to-day -day activities. Some of the inscriptions, if they're too small for you to see are, Distance when you kiss me, distance after you, distance when you sleep next to me, distance when I sit next to you on the train, or the distance between my face and my phone when we FaceTime. By creating this piece, Rika wanted to contrast the easiness of human contact before we had to worry about hurting people we love by getting too close to them with the strict six foot rule. We called our panel silver lining because of the meaning of that phrase, a sign of hope in an unfortunate or gloomy situation. We hope that you will agree, despite the challenges of the COVID pandemic, 
these letterpress inspired projects I've just shared with you certainly signal bright prospects to come. Thank you. And we'll move on now to Martha's presentation. On February 14th, 2020, I assembled and moderated a college art association panel of my letterpress printing colleagues in Chicago to talk about their work at the Hilton Hotel on Michigan Avenue. It was followed by an open house in the School of the Art Institute of Chicago letterpress studio, just a few blocks down the street. It was Valentine's Day and in the beautiful, well-kept letterpress studio, we printed two colored valentines, ate heart-shaped cookies, and felt strongly connected by a sense of place. A few weeks later in the letterpress studio, I was teaching letterpress broadside editions, a course which focuses on public space and the place or, of the poster or broadside in it, when our local stay-at-home orders began. I was at home with my Vandercook Press in Berlin, just southwest of Chicago. But my students, how could they print without printing presses? I thought it was important that I figure that out and explain it to them. I learned ultimately that that was not the most important thing after all. I'm going to talk about three students who were in the broadside course in the spring semester of 2020. I will pair up two prints from each of them, one from before the lockdown and one during. The students are, Megan, who went home to her parents in Florida for the remainder of the semester. Giselle, who went to be with her family in New York. And Stephanie, who remained with her partner in their apartment in the neighborhood of Rogers Park in Chicago. In general, their pre-lockdown work was united by a sense of place, SAIC Chicago. The work created during the lockdown presented geographic problems. Everyone went to their own places and were in different locations. Each had varying access to art supplies and no access to letterpress equipment. After rewriting my syllabus to take the lockdown into account, I arrived at a print portfolio exchange titled Balm for the Soul. I spent a lot of time working on instructions for the students on how they could print at home. And once the lockdown began, I communicated with them mostly by email and on the course bulletin board. Some students wanted to talk on Zoom, but most did not. The project parameters were revised broadsides, bomb for the soul, historical model, Chicago fire posters, cholera, Spanish flu, polio broadsides, music broadsides. Balm is healing, comforting, support, relief. What kind of balm do you look for in times of trouble? A certain song, a particular book or food, Right to design a poster about yeah. it. Consider the current situation that we find ourselves in the world. Think about the following. What is letterpress? Can it be carried out in the absence of equipment? If yes, then how? And why did people invent all these ways to communicate? Giselle Arellana, her two prints were SESC in one word, and don't be upsetty. Both of Giselle's broadsides have a sense of place. One is centered on SAIC and one on home. They share a sense of play with language. Both are carefully planned out as seen in the meticulous, ambitious design of SAIC in one word and the well laid out hand cut stencils and ambitious use of color in don't be upsetty. For the pre-lockdown broadside, Giselle pulled her friends all words were provided by SAIC students to ask them to describe SAIC in one word, which she then incorporated into a word game. For the critique, she showed one completed game and one that had not been solved. There was laughter at some of the words, along with discussion on whether they had been spelled correctly, bougie and art ho, and nods of agreement at the words, lazy, conceptual, and accepting. 
During lockdown, Giselle wrote about her in-progress goals for a print. I plan on making a funny comfort poster with the saying, don't be upsetty, eat some spaghetti. When I was younger and not in the best mood, I would always say this phrase to brighten the mood up. I also take a lot of comfort in food when I'm feeling upset. In general, I eat a lot of food, but I feel like eating food during quarantine feels different. I plan on printing this with a jelly plate. I'm excited because I've never used a jelly plate before and the technique looks so cool. And I also might have a background color, but I don't know yet, I'm still deciding. When my jelly plate comes in the, in the mail, I'm going to be experimenting. To define some of the shapes, Giselle drew with a Sharpie pen to outline the pasta dish and define the spaghetti with a squiggly line. For SEIC in one word, she had also used a pen, this time red, to solve the game with a curvy sinuous line. Giselle's subject writing and casual line quality work together to convey her lighthearted, honest approach to SASC and the lockdown. Megan Earl. Before the lockdown, Megan said that the war referred to and who will touch me from the poem by Zaina Alsus on longing published 2017 is an internal war an emotional war. The broadside speaks in a loud voice in capital letters shouting. A proof on brown paper was hanging in the letterpress studio for months after the lockdown. So it sticks in my mind as an emblem of the time. Megan's post-lockdown broadside used the following words. These are the days that must happen to you. From Walt Whitman, Song of the Open Road, 1856. It feels like a an answer to who will touch me. Megan wrote on the, about the Whitman quote. It's a line that has gotten me through a lot. It's neither encouraging nor disheartening. I think it's a bit consoling to know that there are just some things and some days that we have to live through and that they're made for us to do. The flowers are linoleum cut and the words are from her father's typewriter. These are the days it is quiet, beautiful. The flowers nestle the type. The print speaks to comfort and the need to be able to go on. The flower shapes can be read as two figures with the Walt, Whit Walt Whitman quote between them suspended. A sense of energy is communicated by the asymmetrical composition and expressionistic flower shapes. And a feeling of calmness is communicated by the small lines of text. Stephanie Shviderek. Pre-lockdown, Stephanie's work was centered on her mother. She was a graduate student in the photography department and had created a body of work on this theme. During the lockdown, she wrote a series of poems that she used for Balm for the Soul. The poems, which I read as a kind of manifesto, are comments about the greater world, but come back to her humanity and the love of her mother. Stephanie on, on panic pandemic in progress. With everything going on, I decided I wanted to write a poem for each letter of the alphabet, thinking about the things that are happening and what I'm personally feeling and seeing through this time. We had visited the, the AIC print and drawing room as a class earlier in the semester and looked at Jenny Holzer's truisms. Stephanie was influenced by Holzer's work, but created a profound piece of her own. For her prints, the cover page was typed in the shape of the letter I. Some of the lines seemed ripped from the headlines, others profound. The cumulative effect was of a time capsule capturing the moment. Stephanie's ability to combine disparate influences, the alphabet book, beat poetry, and the manifesto was impressive. I wrote on the course bulletin board at the time, I'm so glad that you drew on your strength to create this piece. Even though it was inspired by this terrible time, I think you will look back on panic pandemic without regret and as something to build upon in your work. When I was looking 
at Stephanie's website recently. I saw that she had published her panic pandemic writing there, giving it pride of place. At some point during the lockdown, I had thought that despite our physical separation, we were like the Who's in Whoville in Dr. Seuss. The coronavirus crunch took our Christmas presents and printing equipment away, but couldn't deprive us of our care for each other. We learned how to come together in a virtual space, sing our songs and hold on to each other as artists and letterpress printers, no matter the pandemic. And now we will have a discussion with Mint, Lou and Dave Jviak. Hello. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> what we've done is uh, created three or four questions that we thought would be relevant to the panel and to giving you uh, a peek at how the students might have reacted to the COVID pandemic. Since you had just heard Martha and I as instructors, Mint and Dave are going to respond to these questions and certainly say whatever they're feeling. So the first question was, although neither of you were in letterpress during spring of 2020, as veteran letterpress printers now, what is your reaction to the final projects that Martha and I just showed? Either of you can start. Yeah. Um, well, looking at this piece of secret sensation in my heart, um, I'm transported back to my experiences during quarantine and how I felt to strongly express myself with limited resources. In the fall of 2019, I took my first letterpress class with Martha. It was almost too easy to fall in love with the medium, and I developed strong friendships and deep respect for my classmates that took the class alongside me. I loved it so much that in the following winter, I did everything to find a way to stay in the letterpress community. Luckily, Ryan Basile offered me an internship and I was ready to give it my all. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the lockdown took about, was announced about a week or two later. The disappointment was seriously overwhelming. Throughout the lockdown, I desperately attempted to emulate the experience I once felt. Emotions of being packed shoulder to shoulder at a crowded table, the sensation of smeared ink on my arm from my classmate's hand, the ache of my forearm from cranking the press. All my crude homemade books from that time remind me of my longing, and these final projects have the same effect on me. The loss that made me realize I never want to let go of blood press again. Mm -hmm. um, and these pieces bring me back to the confusion, the anger, the anxiety that I was trying to process as a student during COVID. I was the type of student who loved homework and simply devoted myself to my studies. Seeing these pieces remind me of nights locked in my room as I desperately tried to find some kind of energy to create any sort of a project. I remember grappling with the idea of paying tuition to receive no resources in return. When I see these projects, I see art students persevering in any way they can. In this case, bookmakers funneling, funneling the complicated feelings of lockdown into writing to then filter them through bookmaking. Okay, so we go to the second question, which was <clears throat> wearing masks, staying six feet apart, and the room capacity limiting the student enrollment for the letterpress courses. What do you see as the positive and negative results of those restrictions? Well, <laughs> since my first letterpress class was a mask with about 15 students, the studio was almost always busy and chaotic. As selfish as it sounds, the student enrollment cap was a plus for me. I could ask Martha and Kathy more questions, have more access to the presses, and have more room to lay out my project. There was more time to focus. On the other hand, it was devastating to be so far from my classmates. Of course, I could still experience my classmates' books from a distance, but never get close to fully understanding each other's strengths or weaknesses. I really feel like proximity is what Kathy and Martha's class is. 
I got to understand their strengths and weaknesses, and we encourage each other to create our masterpieces. It's somewhat unfathomable to, unfathomable to get vulnerable if you have to yell out your deepest insecurities from across the room. Mm -hmm. Due to the smaller class sizes, there was no competition to sign up for the press during midterms or finals. There was no worry that there was another student using the same typeface as you. Ink didn't run out as quickly and all the tools were in place. The best part was diving deep into critiques and getting absolutely lost since there was no time crunch due to the smaller class size. The negative is that the studio is not nearly as alive. Even though there's a lot of dust involved with the letterpress practice, there was even more opportunities for dust to collect in a nearly empty classroom. My second time taking letterpress with full capacity, there was a new book being made in every aisle of the studio. There was a buddy next to you to complain about how tired our fingers were from typesetting. And anytime there was a question, concern, critique, or discovery, there was a fellow printer right behind you. Great. Our third question was, out of the few students that took letterpress during COVID, several of them actually came back later to continue letterpress. What do you think that says about the media? Sure. Um, well, I took on the role of TA or lab monitor around the time when quarantine students returned to continue letterpress. From those that shared their reasons why they returned, it was almost always the same. Redemption, tactility, and space. Same as me, they got a taste and wanted more. Student, students felt their learning experiences were interrupted and craved to see it through, especially since letterpress is a tactile medium it was all the more attractive for the students who felt understimulated during quarantine. After all, the sensation of lost riches in type expressed a magnitude of emotion more than a Xerox printed sheet. When social distancing requirements started to lessen, I remember relating to a student about how the letterpress studio was our second home away from home. We conceptualized, created, ate, cried, and napped in the studio. I knew I could wait to shed tears in the letterpress studio whenever I was feeling sad. I have a theory that students are attracted to the vibrance of new type and are comforted by the presence of previous artists and printmakers who felt the same emotions as them years and years before. Hmm. My first time around, uh, I was on my tiptoes and six feet away, desperately trying to see the thinnest copper spacing Kathy was adjusting. Next thing you know, I heard my classmate sniffle and I would add, anxiously add an extra foot away from the Vandercook. When it was not my turn to print, I would look at the handle and wonder if it's even safe to touch. Kathy assigned videos and films to watch. Safe at home, I watched the recorded pre-COVID world where I saw shops packed with printers. I saw a letterpress community that, was, that had an immediate un mutual understanding of each other's needs to get inky and make sure their passion survives the test of time. From videos documenting the history of letterpress, I knew that the experience I was getting was the restricted version. I was only getting a baby spoon taste of it. <laughs> My last semester at school, the mask mandate was lifted and I signed up for letterpress again. This time around, I wondered what the shop would feel like with multiple full classes sharing the letterpress studio. This is when I discovered one of my favorite feelings which is seeing an entire class huddling around the bed of the press as we intently watch Kathy explain all the bits. It looked just like an operation table as Kathy used tweeter, tweezers to adjust the smallest details and called out for furniture that the students needed to grab. We need a 10 by 40 and a 10 by 50 stat. Nothing beats watching the smiles grow as the first demonstration print gets revealed and we all know the surgery was a success. I was no longer afraid to touch all the tools and type that had gone through the hands of countless designers before me. <laughs> I, I will add, though, that we did have wipes and so mm -hmm. clean everything. Um, so we were taking all the precautions that we possibly could. Definitely, definitely we were. Um, that brings us really to the fulfillment of what we were planning to present. If there's any questions or comments, the audience would like to make, we would be glad to respond to them.
I'm curious uh, what, if anything, um, did you have as takeaways from the lockdown time that you have uh, folded into your practice, even you know outside of lockdown and outside of COVID concerns? What were there? What were the silver linings for you that um, expanded your practice? I think I have to think really quickly about that. I think the resources that I had in pandemic were so little that I just naturally became very crafty in how I got my resources. And so before I would, I feel like in pandemic, I use that as an opportunity to experiment a lot mm -hmm. because there weren't as many things in my reach. I kind of just blew up and used printer paper to messily sketch something out or make random um, different book formats and everything. And so I really felt like that craftiness that I learned from the pandemic and resourcefulness, it, it made me appreciate the medium a lot more. Um, I took a lot more time to plan things out very carefully because I really never knew when lockdown would happen again. And I was constantly getting sick, and not COVID, but getting sick. And I got identified as close contact multiple times. And so I really, really had to try to figure out, okay, when's the next time I'll get sick? I don't know. So I have to work quicker. I have to work smarter. So I think those things really affect me now mm -hmm. where I plan a lot more. Yeah. I definitely think my, the pandemic affected my involvement with the community now, maybe less so my work. Um, but more so in terms of just like how badly I want to be involved with the community, because I wanted to start letterpress when I was 19. Um, but due to my commute and then the pandemic, I couldn't start until I was 21. Um, so I just feel like I always think about the stories that I wanted to tell as a 19 year old, but literally couldn't couldn't start and couldn't do it. Um, so once I had two semesters of letterpress underneath my belt and then I graduated, I definitely think that the pandemic has pushed me to like look for opportunities like this to stay involved in the letterpress community and keep growing. And, you know, I just visited Hat Show Print. So, you know, like I went out into the world and actually saw more letterpress studios and what have you. Um, so I think the pandemic has pushed me to stay involved and make up for lost time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think we have time for one last question, if anybody has one. Okay, oh, Sarah, Sarah or Silo, one of you has a question. Sorry, I was just—I thought I'd just very quickly say, first of all, I really enjoyed hearing all of you speak. Thank you. Second, um, one of the things I found was because teaching letterpress remotely meant that I, I had to employ tools and tactics that were much more um, kind of low tech. And I was doing a lot of like stamps and stencils and all kinds of different things over the, this is before we went back to the studios. But one of the byproducts was that I ended up finding that that stuff would infiltrate into the rest of my life. So I'd be learning or relearning how to do that. And then my kid would come downstairs and, and then we would spend two hours doing it. And then I would kind of play around. Like, it just seemed like it made it into a wider, I could share it with more people a little bit, if you know what I mean. And so I wonder if you have, um, any comments about that, whether that was something that you experienced as well? I definitely, what that makes me think of is the distance that like between letterpress and COVID, like that was a certain type of distance, um, but also now being a graduate, that's a kind of different difference, different kind of, of distance, excuse me, um, where I knew that once I graduate SEIC, you know, my access to the type shop, I had to go and find other ways to print. So I definitely think about like the stamps, carving, how can we continue that when we don't have necessarily have quick access to the SAIC type shop? It's a different type of distance, <laughs> but similar. Right. Um, I actually got a professional press around this time. And so I was experimenting a lot with type design. And so I would um, use random wood that from my old projects um, from earlier years and I would use my lino cutter to cut everything out and I would make type and print it out to see how it looked and it, it was really fun actually and I think a part of me became more creative because of it but with stuff like that what was actually 
top corner right here. Um, but yeah, it, there's all, I feel like as an artist or printmaker or what have you, there's always an opportunity to make something interesting. I remember one of my friends saying before that if you put any medium in front of an artist, they'll create something interesting. And I think about that a lot where, especially during a pandemic, <laughs> there's tons of stories to be told. There's tons of mediums to introduce yourself to. And I'm sure a lot of other people have encountered other hobbies that aren't their normal practice because they were bored. So I think there was always something to experiment with, especially with print. Okay, hey, well, I think we're out of time so that we can have a little break between the panels, but I want to give a big round of applause to our our panelists. Thank you very much for sharing your stories. Thank you. So hi, everybody. Welcome back. Um, if you weren't here yesterday, I'm Rachel Simmons, and I'm currently serving on the CBAA board as the vice chair for meetings. So I helped to organize this symposium. And our next panel is, what if we share dreaming as public good? We're gonna hear from Leah Macklin, Levi Sherman, and Aaron Coick. And they are, I believe, ready to go. Great, thank you. Um, let me just screen share real quick. Okay. Um, okay. Can everyone see that? Yes. Great. Yes. Okay. Um, well, so um, nice to see some familiar faces. Um, for anyone I don't know already, uh, my name is Levi Sherman. I'm joining from Madison, Wisconsin. And um, I would like to begin by thanking the Meetings and Programs Committee um, and everyone else who helped put together this year's virtual symposium. Um, and thanks also to my fellow panelists, Aaron Koek and Leah Mackin. Um, Aaron has pre-recorded his presentation, but he is here live, um, at least as far as cell phone reception will allow uh, while moving. So um, thanks for being here, Aaron. Um, and um, we've also reserved time at the end for discussion and collective brainstorming, which seemed important given the session's theme, shared dreaming as public good. Um, so we'll share a link to a Google Doc that'll have a space for collaboration, um, also a list of all the links and resources that we're going to mention throughout our presentations, as well as links to each of our presentations. Um, so look out for that in the chat. Um, and in the meantime, my contribution to the panel is shared dreaming when the emergency replaces the contemporary. And since I'm presenting first, I'll also briefly introduce the Artist Book Conversations, or ABC, that each of us will be discussing. The Artist Book Conversations are an ongoing series of public Zoom chats about how members of the book arts, artist publishing, and print communities, interpreted as broadly as possible, can support each other through mutual aid, resource sharing, and tool or infrastructure building. ABC was directly inspired by the letterpress educator uh, meetings that Aaron Beckloss started during COVID-19, which hopefully people heard about yesterday. Um, and so it would be fair to call ABC a pandemic project. However, ABC is more than that. And to bring its future potential into focus, I would like to begin with a slightly longer history. In 2012, artist Thierry Geoffroy infiltrated Documenta 13 with a tent bearing the spray painted slogan, the emergency will replace the contemporary. The tent evokes all manner of natural and man-made disasters, making it easy to focus on the, on the emergency. However, Geoffroy's criticism of the contemporary is just as important. As an art historian who studies contemporary art, I'm all too aware that everyone has a different definition of contemporary. For Geoffroy, this shows that contemporary art, that the contemporary art world is no longer living with time, cone tempo. Sociologist Pascal Guillen explains the crisis of contemporary as an art category in his essay, Institutional Imagination, Instituting Contemporary Art Minus the Contemporary. On one hand, the contemporary refuses to let go of the past. Hence, my own art is contemporary, and so is the art of the 1960s and 70s, which I study as an art historian. And on the other hand, 
that contemporary is no longer avant-garde. At best, contemporary art bears witness to the present, but no longer claims to lead the way to a better future. With no historical depth and no vision of the future, time is flat. Time is flat, Guillen argues, the way that everything is flat in a world dominated by global neoliberal capitalism, a world where everything and everyone can be exchanged in a free market. It follows, if everything is fungible and fluid, that the world is not just flat, but liquid, to use Zygmunt Bauman's term. We are all, in other words, treading water in a free market that is so flexible and flat that we can see neither the past nor the future, or worse, we're drowning in it. To extend the watery metaphor, it is in the literal wake of COVID-19, which is not quite over, that we see Geoffroy's prediction manifest. The emergency has indeed replaced the contemporary. We see it in the strange sense of time we have experienced since March of 2020. Day to day, COVID time perhaps exacerbated the flatness and fluidity of our precarious existence. For many of us, work hours blend into personal time and weekdays into weekends. However, COVID-19 also definitively ruptured time, making it possible to see the past and glimpse the future. We became aware of a distinct pre-pandemic era, but also of longer histories like the Spanish flu and the Black Death. We also began to imagine futures that were radically different from the past and present, some apocalyptic and others utopian. It was during this flat COVID time, December 2021, that ABC began with the question, what does the book arts, artist books, and artist publishing community need to thrive? I joined these conversations from another kind of flatness, the flyover state of Wisconsin, where I had just begun a PhD program in art history while still working remotely for the University of Missouri. I was between states, jobs, institutions, and disciplines. And for the first time since earning my MFA, I was without a studio space. In short, I was already wondering, what does a book artist need to thrive? Guillain populates his critique of the neoliberal art world turned water world with various vessels. Gone are the big stable ships representing major institutions. Sure, there are a few luxury yachts, but the rest of us make do with lifeboats and safety rings. The pandemic laid bare these disparities between the haves and the have nots. And certainly the former have consolidated even greater wealth and power since 2020. I would argue, however, that certain divisions were also eroded like the merchant marine in a wartime evacuation or the so-called Cajun Navy after a hurricane, institutions of all sorts briefly set aside their missions and responded to the emergency. Some of us who had been treading water found ourselves on new vessels, sometimes as passengers, sometimes crew, and maybe even as stowaways. Individuals and institutions interfaced directly in ways that were unimaginable before the pandemic. I was especially interested in how this fraught relationship between the individual and the institution, the subject of decades of institutional critique and arguably centuries of art before that, would play out in the artist book conversations. If institutions are characterized by verticality, as opposed to the flatness I have been describing, this top-down pressure all but disappeared during the pandemic. Universities issued little and often contradictory guidance leaving individuals to make difficult decisions and solve tough challenges. Instructors turn to online communities for advice and support as procurement policies and copyright all but vanished. Universities relied on the creativity and entrepreneurship of their individual employees, conditioned by decades of neoliberalism, even as so-called lockdowns reminded us that labor is always the source of value. Though easily exploited by institutions, this flattening also has potential as a democratizing force. A tenet of ABC is that participants join as individuals rather than representatives of our respective institutions. And I just wanna briefly comment on this image, which is sort of seared into my mind um, as representing the pandemic where Woody Leslie at Murray State University had put up um, custom signage requiring masks and then seemingly um, in a prescient move added commend to recommend them as opposed to requiring on a label. And then a few weeks after this was posted, um, another video was presented of the commend coming off as masks became required again in the fall, um, which I think many of us had similar experiences at our own institutions. Um, 
back to our nautical metaphors. At the same time, verticality has advantages. These are manifest in the hierarchical power that is the target of traditional institutional critique. The vertical institution has a basement or foundation, which we can call history. It also has a view from the top, which we can call the future. Furthermore, the institution is visible. It rises above the flat, fluid marketplace. Such advantages have been abused by institutions, but artists should not give them up and resign to life in a lifeboat, nor should they seek to replicate institutionality as it existed before the pandemic. If I may stretch the nautical metaphors even further, perhaps we can turn the ivory tower into a lighthouse. In the meantime, there is less lofty but still important work to be done. By sharing resources, artists can leave their lifesavers and build a raft together. One striking lesson from ABC is that often these resources are not zero sum. We can share information with one another without losing anything. My colleague Leah will share an example of this, the Collections Contact List Project, which crowdsourced information about artist book dealers, retailers, and collectors. Instead of competing against one another for a piece of an institution's acquisition budget, the artists, librarians, and others who contributed to this open access database saw the benefit of transparent, up-to-date information about a collection's budget, scope, and purpose. I have already used the collection's contact list to advise other artists about where to place their work, but the project also has value for bigger picture initiatives in the future. For example, a survey of collection scopes might reveal systemic misalignments between artists and collections that would otherwise remain invisible, perhaps even to the artists whose work is slipping between those cracks. It was critical that the collections contact list project solved problems not just for artists, but also for collectors. And it was able to do so because both constituencies were in the room, or rather the Zoom, together. ABC allows for people to express their needs and share their resources without ulterior motive. Where neoliberal institutions set metrics, which too often become ends in themselves, there is little room or reason to game a structure like ABC. There are no bureaucrats to audit our efforts. We either help one another or we don't. In this way, ABC shares methods with second wave institutional critique. Instead of holding public institutions accountable from outside, we work from within and between neoliberal institutions to turn their resources back toward the public good. However, ABC goes beyond this approach in important ways, ways which may characterize the third wave of institutional critique that Guillen and others call for. Critically, ABC is a collective endeavor. There is no heroic artist as Robin Hood. There are no leaders per se, only facilitators, note takers, and other volunteers. We crowdsource discussion topics and then vote on which topics will be prioritized in each meeting. If institutional critique has taught us about the aesthetics of administration, then even these mundane logistical aspects of ABC are critically important. The exercise of publicly stating what we need and what we can contribute is a valuable end in itself. Whether we hope to reimagine institutions or simply survive between them, it is only by working and dreaming together that we will find a future in a contemporary of simultaneous emergencies. Thank you for your attention in the flat virtual space of Zoom. And it is now my pleasure to turn things over to Leah who will ground these broad ideas in specific examples from ABC. Hi, Addie, how are you? Hi. Okay, let me just get this set up. Thank you so much, Levi. Thank you to Aaron uh, at the rest stop or wherever you might be at the moment. Um, thanks all for having us here, being here. Um, so as Levi introduced, I am here and excited to share information about the collection and re a retailer's contact list project. This project um, is particularly exciting for me to discuss and share with you all, not just to 
throw it at you as a, an, another resource for your toolkit and your teaching, but also to think about that um, kind of transition point between the what, the what if we, the dreaming, and then a tangible action, getting a project done, and allowing that project to serve as a platform for future possibilities. I need to, want to acknowledge that this was a collective action. Um, it was not a, a singular person who came up with this idea. I think that it's really stemmed out of a conversation from one of the early-ish ABC meets. Um, I don't have the exact kind of like seed of this idea um, at the ready, but uh, early, early on ABC meets, maybe late, late winter of 2022. And as the conversation evolved in the meeting, we realized that this was worthy, this project was worthy of more attention. And we kind of broke out and had a few other conversations, many an email thread. So thank you to Alicia Bailey, Anna Bernhard, Aaron Koak, of course, Carrie Mikilani Schroeder, Sarah Nichols, and Levi Sherman. We all recognized that we likely had different flavors, versions of a collections contact list, uh, maybe a kind of Google map of different retailers that uh, we knew distributed, sold artist books. We know that they are helpful and necessary for artists to promote new works, sell their back catalog, maintain connections, and think about those um, potential research or visit opportunities. So knowing that we had these individually created lists, we started identifying the, the futility of them. Um, perhaps there is an outdated color-coded system that you know years ago made sense and no, no longer does. Um, of course, librarians, collection managers, change institutions, their contact information may change, et cetera. We also, as Levi mentioned, wanted to kind of allow collection managers, retailers um, to participate in this project and have it be an opt-in as opposed to all of us kind of uh, scraping library websites, for example, to try to find the best contact person. Um, this also would allow and open up the information collected rather than just their immediate contact info, um, their preferred methods of communication, their collection scope or interest as booksellers, um, and ways that um, we could expand that conversation. So our goal we're making this list, right? And we wanted to make sure that it was accessible. So to think about access in a way of a public open access editable document. As I mentioned, we wanted to include other information besides contact info. And we decided collectively um, that we wanted to compile and share only publicly available contact information. We asked, well, how are we going to maintain this list? And I have uh, uh, our first idea here in italics because it has not happened yet. Um, but we do think that it, it I think it should happen. Uh, maybe a, an annual email message sent out to the contact list on that sheet to um, see if there are any updates. Collective maintenance is an ongoing effort with the project. And I'll get into that a little bit. A bonus conversation that stemmed out of our kind of sub meetings um, from the ABC meet was really just thinking about various approaches of promoting works, um, sample prospectuses, catalogs, postcards, um, methods of that kind of uh, cold call email, for example, that can go out to um, a collection manager. We created a Google form that captured information from individuals at institutions or individuals uh, on the distribution retailer side. And then 
that information gets populated into a Google Sheet that then is open for all to edit, add to, maybe um, include uh, uh, some, some updated information over time. And it also includes the links to those forms if somebody arrived at the sheet first and not the form first. As a group, we drafted messages to be sent as individual emails to our personal networks and then um, created these messages that could act as uh, posts on public forums like listservs. Um, we tapped into the Art Library Society of North America um, listserv and the Book Arts listserv. So now I'd like to break out of this and go to the actual sheet itself. So these links here um, on the presentation are first to the actual Google Sheet itself. So when you go to the Google Sheet uh, for the Artist Book Collections Retailer Info List, you'll see it has two tabs at the bottom. And the information that's here is all collected from the Google Forms themselves, which are, again, linked within the actual sheet itself. So as a group, we came up with these, these questions to uh, try to gather as much information as possible um, from the individuals at either institutions or you know proprietors of, of bookseller bookstores or um, galleries, for example, that sell and distribute artist book works. So this is where I think it gets like really exciting and interesting. We've done this thing and I'm thrilled to share it with anyone who hasn't come across it yet. And I hope that you all use it and add it to your list of resources. But as, as Levi was kind of like touching on, this also could really expand some conversations. And it makes me think back to that idea of this now becoming a platform for possibilities. So I'm going to like throw out some of these ideas and hope or invite you all to also think about maybe some possibilities for a project like this or this one in particular. So as Levi mentioned, that idea of um, institutional transparency. So for example, we did ask um, what the budget, annual budget for artist book acquisitions at your institution. And this could spark a conversation on the institutional side. They could say, well, you know, this other institution spends $5,000 a year. We could up or like boost our budget to 30,000 to have a, a more, um, I don't know, similar, or like a, a, a better a better collection. They could um, promote that as um, uh, what comparable institutions might spend on artist books, for example. Uh, was thinking about ways that perhaps these um, these uh, locations could be used as possible um, research opportunities, uh, maybe a cool book arts road trip, maybe next time we're like all in Pittsburgh, we can go down to the Frick Fine Arts Library, right? This opportunity to just kind of see more, learn more about what might be out there and available. And lastly, my I, my idea to share is just like how this as a project could be shared with students as an example of maybe modeling behavior for ways to be generous with information, um, to kind of resist that um, desire to gatekeep uh, information and um, hold it very close to you as an individual, right? So that students can see that this takes some work, but it's valuable for us all. Thank you. And now we're going to go back to Levi to uh, play Aaron's recorded presentation. Thank you, just a moment. Thanks, yep. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you all for being here. Thank you all to uh, CBAA folks who organize this. 
Thank you to my panelists, Leah and Levi, um, for taking care of this panel today. Um, hopefully, I have already apologized for not uh, delivering this presentation live. Um, but um, and before I begin, I want to note that everything that I'm going to talk about in this uh, presentation is um, linked in that resource document that we shared at the beginning of the panel. Okay, um, so with that, I will share my screen and we will begin. Okay, so one important lesson that I learned from the pandemic is that what I value most in my professional life is the people that I am in it with. In the various mutual aid and resource sharing groups that were quickly constructed during the lockdown, I realized that there was potential for the book slash print community to work together in ways that we hadn't before to sustain that engagement over a longer period of time. Inspired by the letterpress educators pandemic chats and the print futures events by partners in print, as well as earlier groups like ILSA, the book slash print artist slash color of color collective and the deck collective. I started scheming on ways to use digital tools to collect and share information and to organize people interested in artist publishing. That idea is nothing new, but I saw a specific need in this community, a need for better infrastructures of support, and a need for time, for, for time to think and dream together about what those might be, about ways that we can make the field more equitable and accessible. Through the art slash tech slash infrastructure podcast interdependence by the artists Holly Herndon and Matt Dryhurst, I heard a quote from the science fiction writer Madeline Ashby, quote, if I had one piece of advice for literally everyone, it would be to talk loudly and frequently and in detail about the future you want. You can't manifest what you don't share, end quote. That quote made me realize that what I want to talk about with my community is the future not the future in terms of decline or doom or kids these days or even flying cars or AI overlords, but the future in terms of a thriving community. I started by asking questions through Instagram posts and surveys and quickly realized that it would be much better to make space for all of us to talk directly to each other. And so I started organizing the ABC meetings. Levi has already described what the meetings are, so I'm gonna skip over all that and talk about how they're framed and how they run. The ABC meetings are for anyone interested in book arts, print, and or artist publishing, all very broadly defined. They are based around these foundational questions. What are the challenges and problems that the book arts slash artist publishing slash print field faces? What are the possibilities inherent to the field and community? How can we build on what we already do well? And what are the conversations that we need to have but rarely make time or space for? We use what I call a loose democratic process to organize the meetings. It's democratic in the sense that it involves input, feedback, and votes from the community. And it's loose in the sense that it, all of those processes are only as structured as they need to be. I maintain a small list, 65 people right now, of folks that have the option of giving input on dates and times for each meeting and that propose and vote on discussion topics. Anyone can join that list and I put out a semi-monthly semi call via Instagram. The pro proposals in voting are central to the whole enterprise. It's about community participation and buy-in at every level. Not everyone makes it to every meeting and that's okay. We don't record them, but we do take notes and screenshots of the chats. Attendance is usually about 10 to 20 folks. If they get much larger, we'll probably have to do breakout rooms, but we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Everything is done low tech and cheap. I use Gmail contact list for the emails. Let us meet for scheduling. Google Drive for files and documentation, Google Forms for voting, and Zoom for the meetings. There's a link in that resource document to the folder that contains everything about the meetings, the notes, a document that goes over each step of planning the individual sessions, the voting forms for each meeting, and various templates for social media posts. All of these documents and processes are open source, so if you see a need for conversations on other topics and or with other groups, then you can start with what we've built and adapt it. I've always hoped that some concrete projects would grow out of the ABC meetings, and some have. The first major one is the Artist Books Collections and Retailers list, which you heard about in Leah's presentation, 
And recently we started discussing a shared event slash deadline calendar and or a Discord server for asynchronous conversation. Another fun thing that was enabled by the meetings is that two younger artists each got a free mimeograph machine from Amos Kennedy. The experience of organizing and participating in these meetings has made me rethink some of the fundamental background assumptions of how we teach art in higher ed and about how those assumptions also structure our relationships to each other. The subtext of most arts education in the US is that the professional art world is a market that the students will have to compete in. That market could be the literal art market, it could be the market for academic or nonprofit jobs or any other art world participation based in competition. That subtext is actualized in what we teach as professional practices, how to document artwork, how to set up a portfolio website, how to write a CV, how to apply to things, and how to do a standard format artist talk. Those are all really important things for students to learn, and I think we need to keep teaching them. But there are so many more things that we also need to share. We all know from direct experience that the market is actually just one aspect of the life and community of art making. Why should we let that one part be the dominant and structuring metaphor for the whole of what we do and teach? The question that I have been asking myself as an educator is what would professional practices look like if we shifted that subtext to art world as ecosystem that one must tend to and nurture, which means that we would have to teach not with just the immediate present in mind, but a better future as well. We could teach professional practices around things like how to organize and participate in studio co-ops for equitable ownership and sharing of resources, how to organize and participate in equitable care-centered collaborative publishing slash art making ventures, how to organize and participate in labor unions, community saving circles, non-extractive loan programs, ways that artists can help to build structures that resist gentrification and extraction, and a whole host of time-tested and refined methods for supporting a thriving community because people have been doing this for as long as there have been people. I've been teaching intro-level undergrad courses for the past decade, so I haven't gotten to do too much formal teaching around professional practices yet, but there's a room for this approach in all classes. In my intro classes, I start with calling it out right in my syllabi, acknowledging the implicit bias of how art is taught and explicitly constructing something different. For assessment, I use a labor-based grading method, which is one approach under a broader category called, uh, un called ungrading. I also try to structure the class to transfer as much trust and agency as possible directly to the students. The anti-racist writing workshop by Felicia Chavez is an excellent guide on how to do that. I've tried to rethink projects and class structures in order to reframe them in terms of mutual aid and or creating public goods and benefits. For example, a very basic version that I've been using in my classes is to set requirements for receiving an A around doing work that contributes to the whole class, either a presentation about an artist that will be shared and archived for future use, a demo of a self-research technique, or devoting two hours to helping another student on a project. I've just been able to scratch the surface of all of this, um, but it all starts with saying that subtext out loud and then intentionally reorienting it towards a better future. Referring to that list of possibilities for professional practice teaching, a recurring idea of the ABC meetings has been a $5 grad school, a community run, highly customizable and broadly accessible professional practice slash mentorship slash apprenticeship program. We're a long way from actually getting anything like that started, but I'm excited about the possibilities. As we build, I also want to keep publishing as much information about that building as possible so that these ideas can be tested, replicated, and adapted by other self-organized groups in our field, as well as in other fields and communities. For me, the ultimate goal is to build systems of support for everyone working in the field, and in particular for folks that are just starting out and or who don't have access to institutional resources or inherited wealth. I want those systems to be flexible and adaptable so that they can be tailored to the needs of individuals and local communities. I want them to be portable and accessible so that people don't have to chase academic jobs, but can live where they want, close to family and or close to chosen family in communities where they feel at home. And I wanna make sure that these systems are not dependent on endless growth and extraction. In closing, I'd like to acknowledge that CBAA is all of us here 
not just the people on the board and on the committees. And I'd like to propose that we, as CBAA, build in time at every conference and meeting to talk about the future, to make time for us to think and dream together, and then to help organize based on those conversations. Personally, I'd like to see it as more than a single panel or event, maybe a whole day that is themed around dreaming and building together. Thank you all. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. We have time for the next part that you want to journey on. Yeah, um, join us. Um, I have dropped the link to a shared Google Doc that we've all referenced um, that has the links to all of our presentations, the um, artist book conversation meeting email for, for Aaron New Lights Press, um, and the ABC meet files, the um, artist book collection and retailer list documents, and then everything that we've mentioned in our presentations or just generally that we compiled um, to share as sources and resources. At the bottom of the document, the last section, which I will put the direct bookmark link in here next, um, is an opportunity for you all to kind of build and dream with us a bit um, together right now. Uh, we have a number of prompts that are in this document, and we invite you to share as you see fit um, if you have responses or ideas that stemmed from our presentations or not from our presentations. Um, if you want to use the chat feature of Zoom because that's maybe more familiar, we can also do some of the, the housekeeping um, on our end. Levi and I will kind of put, put things wherever they belong or read out loud as you see fit or just unmute yourself and shout. I'll just shout out for a moment, because uh, what interested me was because uh, what you were talking about uh, apprenticeship, which uh, you know I've been involved in. I was a member of the National Council on Apprenticeship and Art and Craft in the 70s. In case you don't have it, it might be very useful to get a hold of Apprenticeship and Craft, and it deals with this. Um, uh, it was from the uh, National Endowment for the Arts and the U.S. Office of Education. And it deals with different kinds of apprenticeship, finding, keeping, nurturing, releasing, you know, the problems, the, uh, and that's, that's it, apprenticeship and craft. And uh, you can probably find it for a, a buck or two on uh, aid books or something. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, 450 is uh, the going rate on uh, AV books. Uh, thank you, Richard. That's fantastic. I'll add it to our list. Um, I have a quick question. I wanted to know, um, has your group, been able to see any measurable change or positive outcomes from meeting? Like what are some of the things you're hearing from people who attend the meetings? Um, how is this sharing of information going? Is it is it doing what you want it to do, I guess, is my question. I mean, I can just sort of speak like anecdotally to that. And, you know, really when I I when we agreed to do this panel, I imagine I would be speaking much more about the sort of personal impact. Um, and, you know, I became sort of interested in this, you know, more like historical and sort of theoretical framing, but I will just say like, it was very useful. You know, when I say I was kind of like between states and institutions and all of this and disciplines, um, it, it, it really was helpful in the pandemic and like in a new community where I hadn't met people to know, even like if I missed meetings and just saw the notes, like to remember, that people are meeting and having these conversations and moving the ball forward and like making incremental progress. I think um, the like distributing the notes and showing the fruit of every meeting afterwards, I think that's one thing that has really motivated me. And that I think is a good practice from ABC is this idea that like, you can jump back in anytime, but if you don't show up, like other people are still doing this and engaged and kind of like keeping it, um, keeping it afloat. Um, 
And so I, I definitely, I think that that's, even if there's no big takeaway or like measurable outcome from every meeting, just having that sort of like written record of like a group of humans that dedicated time and thought about these ideas for a while, um, that makes me much more likely to get to the next meeting. Yeah, I think you have someone who shared in the chat that they received a grant through resources that were shared through ABC, which is awesome. Yeah, that is awesome. Um, yeah, to answer your question, Rachel, I was just thinking like, yes, like it has been beneficial. And I, I don't know if I can necessarily pinpoint the reasons why, um, but uh, I will share personally that um, in the fall of 2021, when um, Aaron really initiated these meets, um, I had also left a, a job and had moved to a different city. So that kind of like placelessness that Levi talks about, I think that um, I, like, I personally experienced that, but I also um, recognize the kind of um, maybe personal uh, shifts that we, we maybe made throughout the make, are still making throughout the pandemic um, based off of all of the circumstances and kind of figuring out and prioritizing what's important. So for me, I was really excited to just reconnect with members of a community who I knew and just an opportunity to chat with them, but also folks that I didn't know, right? The new new members and the fact that it is that kind of rotating crew, you don't really know who shows up until you pop into the Zoom. So it's, it, it, there's a, an element of kind of like fun and excitement there too. I know that a Google Doc is a little intimidating. I, I think it looks exciting. I, I think I want to give it some thought and work Fair. on it later. But um, I also, I attended the uh, lead meetings with Aaron during the early days of the pandemic. And so I'm, I'm familiar and very appreciative of this model. Um, and I wonder if you could speak to the pandemic being like kind of opening the opportunity for us to share these resources in a way that we weren't doing in before, I guess, at this scale, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think, oh wait, Aaron, are you able to? to, to uh, I think I think so, you can hear me, right? Yeah, do it, no, go. Okay, hey, everybody, I'm sorry that I'm like kind of uh, on a small thin thread here. I'm, driving some printing presses across the country. I'm stopped in a rest stop in Kansas right now. Um, yeah, thank you, Rachel, for that question. I don't know, like, I feel like it's, it was something that was in the air, right? Like right at that time when kind of everything shut down and we didn't know what the hell we were doing. And um, uh, yeah, and it, you know, and what we, the artist was conversation started kind of later, you know, it wasn't like immediate, um, but it was sort of, from that experience, um, but also learning about like seeing mutual aid kind of things in education in action. And then like, just thinking about like, okay, this this is amazing. Like, how do we kind of extend it? Um, and like, and start to build in these other conversations around like equity and like centering on care um, and things that were like, became oh. so obviously important at that time. Um, and try to, you know, um, try to keep from going back to whatever was right um which is you know it that's an idea that's been floating around um but yeah so i don't know and we're just kind of doing it you know it's very it's very loose um it's very informal and we just kind of keep going it's very it's kind of sporadic we're on a pause right now um but it's working uh, people seem to be enjoying it and um you know so uh yeah I, I just wanted to follow up and say that i think part of what i think was happening for a lot of us is that our institutions were either unavailable or, or frozen or unable to help us. And we book artists, I think, rely so much on institutional connections for equipment, facilities, education, community. And when that went away or we didn't have access to it, I think a lot of people figured out how to build their own community that could go across those institutions or, or disregard them completely and start to kind of build I think Levi was talking about sort of institutional verticality, right? Versus this sort of spread out um, network of equality. 
And I, I, I definitely see that as how, as being an influence in some of the ways these groups came to be. Shiloh, do you want to jump in? I see your hand raised. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I, I just wanted to say this feels really validating and, and just like incredible. Um, I, it's been a while. I got my MFA in book art. Um, I was working with Julie and I found myself as an artist being kind of like at a loss working at nonprofits, um, facing a lot of just enormous institutional debt. And I think, you know, just hearing what you all are talking about, um, it was very difficult for me to continue as an artist. And now I've kind of, I've pivoted and now I'm in this role um, as an art librarian. And I think I'm just seeing the way that book art um, as a field, as it's developing as a field, has this real capacity um, for political activism and artist books and letterpress printing have historically also been so connected um, to community building and political activism that I can just, I feel it like coming back and I, I hear people talking about it. And I just wanted to say like, I'm very excited <laughs> to be here and be seeing this and to be, be in the room with people who care about this and know that it's not just me being like, people like students need book art. They need to know um, that there are interdisciplinary mediums where they can really explore um, explore and dream, right? And sort of decolonize their brains. That's the language that people are using. So that's all. Thank you all so much. Yeah, I want to thank the panelists. We are um, at the end of our session and um, applause. If you'd like to offer some auditory applause, visual applause. <laughs> uh, we're so grateful for the for your efforts in compiling this information and making it available and just contributing to the way that we can come together as a community. Um, it's been, it's, it's an incredible project that you all have been working on. So thank you so much. So I'm gonna be the moderator for this session. And because this is not a preformed panel, I'm going to be just um, letting, letting the panelists know when they hit the 10 minute or 12 minute mark so that they can wrap up their remarks. Um, and I've talked to them during the meet, during the break and they do, they would like to have a little Q and A at the end. So hopefully we will have time, some time for that. So each presenter will introduce themselves at the start of their presentation. And we're going to start with Sue Robinson. So take it away, Sue. Thank you, Julie. I'm, I'm really pleased to be able to be here. Um, it's such a busy time for me. Um, this is my birthday today. I'm also going to be part of um, a studio tour, which I started with another two other artist friends 23 years ago. And this is the last one. So I, I had this difficult choice of trying to do both things, be here and also um, be part of the studio tour. Uh, we'll see how well I can do both at the same time. Um, I, I really appreciate the opportunity to share this uh, change in my teaching of the book arts. Um, to give you a little context, my uh, course, Artist Books and Papermaking at Cal State Long Beach, um, uh, allows students from any of the studio programs in the College of the Arts to take the course as an elective towards their graduation requirements. Um, only uh, upper division students can take the course and only students in the College of the Arts. That being said, there are between 20 and 24 students at a time per semester. And um, they come from all different disciplines, uh, fiber, wood, painting and drawing, printmaking, illustration, a whole range um, of disciplines. There is no book art program at Cal State, um, Cal State Long Beach. My course is the only course. Uh, so all of these students who enroll, I've found, most of them have never made paper and have never made a book. So it's a basic course and I always 
emphasize that it is not a course in, in book binding. Um, it is a course in artist books. So that um, is, there are very basic things, but we also cover a lot of artist books. So students actually make an altered book. They do folded glued structures and they do a wide variety of sewn bindings. And in the past, pre-pandemic, um, the final project was actually the final exam and they were expected to do an addition. So the addition was in the same number of uh, students in the course plus me. And at the final exam, uh, each student distributed their edition book to their classmates. And we all went home with a little collection of artist books. Um, that was the one thing that changed quite drastically with the pandemic. Um, during the pandemic, there were very few uh, courses, I think ceramics might have been the only one, that allowed any in-person teaching at all. Um, and, it, and there were a lot of um, regulations for how to achieve that. But the fiber department and my course, um, all of those were on Zoom completely. Uh, there was no in-person um, meeting. So students received a package of basic supplies. And at the end of the course, they had to return some of them. Um, but everything that they needed to make a book was in that package. They didn't have access to the paper making equipment or the paper lab. So I ended up demonstrating how to make paper in my study, which is where I'm sitting now, using a dishpan and a home blender. And they did end up making paper from various um, natural fibers that they found wherever they were. Um, the rest of the course, uh, I had a little camera. People could see the demonstrations um, that I gave. And that, of course, they I could see what they were doing as well. So the biggest change, aside from the paper making <laughs> aspect, the biggest change in this was the final exam. Um, we were not going to be meeting in person, so there was no distributing of their own work to each other. Um, and so uh, they had to come, I had to come up with something else that would contribute to their learning. And it turned out that during the pandemic, the actual bookbinding aspect of the course was a bomb. For people. People really felt um, calm. Um, once they had mastered a particular binding, they found it very soothing to continue. So they had the opportunity, I think, um, to share with each other because they did show their work uh, on Zoom. The final exam, and I had 20 students, uh, the final exam has to take place between um, a, a two hour window. That's the requirement of the school. And so everyone had to do a presentation that did not last very long since there were 20 students. Um, and so I asked them specifically to think of themselves as curators if you were going to put together an exhibition uh, on paper art or artist books, um, you would have to have a title for it, you would have to have a thesis, and you would have to have some examples of what it was that you were trying to present. So because there were so many students, I asked them to have at least five examples of the artwork that they wanted. What 
turned out to be um, very valuable, I think, both for the students and for me, was that they had to think about artist books in a, in a broader context than just their own individual work. And they also could do research on any topic that they came up with. And then during the final exam, share it in presentations. So that's what I'm gonna show you now, I hope. Um, and they each came up with ideas that they wanted to research and presentations, so. Let's see. The students really, um, I hope everybody can see that, began doing research on themes that interested them. So Mindy Lee felt that we had not really covered the whole spectrum of <laughs> artist books and chose to do innovative artist books by Asian women. And she presented these in addition to her um, statement, she presented these artists. This one of course is about 13 feet across. Julie's work was part of her presentation. The Secret Language of Women. And I realized, I realized at that point that they were learning a great deal about artist books um, in these various themes that we hadn't been able to cover in the course because we were focused on sort of how to rather than those various topics. So here's another one. Liros de Latin America by Isaac Garcia. He felt that it was important to look at these books from the point of view of the state of migration, personal history, or cultural aesthetics of these artists. Sandra Fernandez was Ecuadorian, although born in Queens, New York. Maritza Perez is Cubana. Gilvan Samico is Brazilian. And Josli Carvalho was Brazilian, born in Sao, pa Sao Paulo and residing in New York. So each of the students had to come up with this theme, a statement, and provide information. Forced roles and object, objectification by Nadia Garcia. Her thesis was how women faced object, objectification. And even though a lot of the images uh, came from an uh, older set of things. She felt that some of the subjects were still um, um, part of today's culture. And these are her slides. Birth Control by Ginger Burrell. And I think this is also by Ginger Burrell. Um, we're not seeing the slide, Sue. Oh. Um, while you're getting those up though, um, you have about three minutes left, so. Okay. All right. You can see them now. Yes, we can see them now. 
So this one was all about women and the culture of women. And I think it, the title was Forced Roles and Objectification. And uh, I'll show just one more. But really, where are you from? An exhibition of Asian artists and their stories. And the students had to describe why they chose these particular ones. That's it, I think. <laughs> Great, thank you, Sue. That was really fascinating. Um, our next speaker is Nikki Barnes. So if you wanna get started and we'll have hopefully some time at the end to ask questions of all the, any of the panelists. Hi, thank you so much. Super excited. All the thoughts and it's like really hard to present when I want to talk about what Sue just said right now. <laughs> um, okay, so we know where we are. This is me. <laughs> I am, I have two master's degrees. I'm here because I love sculptural making and experimental poeming and of course educating. Um, the disruption of the lockdown of course opened up spaces to critically reevaluate methods and methodologies which has informed my dissertation, um, which is structured by three pillars, which is intersectional feminisms, design justice, and liberatory pedagogy, which I'm gonna talk more about. But I wanna give away the ending of this talk, which is that our students uh, really expanded their practice of collaboration, innovation, and transformative works that then um, shape our, our future, their future, and really redefine craft. So this is a little bit of my work, just so you know, um, <laughs> I belong here. <laughs> um, I work with conceptual book making. Um, I came to this field through my MFA, which was a material um, experimental hybrid poetry work. And what I'm working on now are really academic zines that kind of reshapes the practice of who we are citing and what works we are citing and how we are drawing those works into academic conversations. So this is today's work, the poetics of book arts and liberatory pedagogy in student workshops. So what are the poetics of book arts? Theory, structure, form. Book arts is a discipline of form and structure. Um, this is the part that you know we all share a vocabulary for. What I want to add to that is that poetry is also making with deep inquiry into structure, language, text, material. Um, there's an incredible artist you may be familiar with, Mel Bachner, and he he created work directly on the walls of museums and writing in paint, writing text in paint. And of course, my favorite one says language is material. So using that, um, that perspective and joining it with Matt Ratto's work on critical making, which means we are, we are learning, we are building knowledge, we are acquiring knowledge, making is research as we go through the process. So who we are in community with in, in this classroom situation, um, which of course has been all the modes, right? On Zoom, hybrid and face-to-face -face, are the concrete poets, which are sometimes, um, sometimes misunderstood outside of the field and lumped in with visual poetics and concrete poets are concerned with structure. It's not just 
um, making pictures with words on a page or on a surface, um, but they are they are using the structures of mark making, of language, of text itself. So I'm going to show you a quick example of my very most favorite. Um, and of course, this poem is called Silencio. And I think you can see right away how, how transcendent it is. Um, you know, how do we speak the word silencio without negating its meaning? And then when we have the absence of words, we finally have like the true expression of the piece. And you can, this has also been identified as a sonnet because there are 14 words in it. And they're all um, I am's for all of you poetry nerds out there, if you're hiding somewhere in the book arts community. And we, um, I think we're not seeing the slide. Oh my goodness. We're supposed to be seeing it. You're totally right. I'm sorry. Um, I will tell you it is, because I'm so sorry about like, I don't want to, I will share the link with you in the chat so you can pull it up. Um, it's a single word poem um, and it's super beautiful. You're going to fall in love with it. Um, so the, the rest of this um, understanding of who we're in community with is of course the world of book artists, um, makers who are folding, sewing, binding, and joining. Um, this is a community of practitioners engaged with material. And so speaking with my, um, my world of creative writers, of emerging poets, they start to see themselves as makers in a creative space. And that space is always a hybrid space because we have you know, multiple identities. We are students, we are learners, we're family members. We're always porting those identities into um, you know, multiple, multiple layered experiences, even though you know, like we're here right now, you know, with Sue having her birthday at the same time and these other events like happening right outside, we all have those multiple contexts happening simultaneously. And so what was exciting about, um, in, in a positive generative way of our experience in lockdown is those became explicit and we acknowledged that we were bringing these multiple experiences and these multiple identities into our, our learning environments as well. And what a great space that is for book arts and other um, hybrid forms. So this is another experimental poet, but of course, I think you can see right away the link to printmaking. So Ticello is a Brazilian writer and he, you know, if he were here, he would tell you that these are poems. But I think when we look at them in the context of book arts and letterpress and printmaking, we can see that there is a spirit of making and structure happening here that it really is not limited in any way toward what a poem might be. So I show my students the relationship between conceptual books and a scenic writing. And the picture with the drawers is a book, an artist book that of my own making um, called Eddie's. And then Sam Rojas Shua is an incredible um, a scenic writer. A scenic, of course, meaning writing that cannot be read. So here we have um, another example where the maker is calling this work a poem. However, I see much more going on here. And I think you you would agree with me that it looks sort of like an artist book. I mean, it is an artist book. So what is interesting to the conversation that I am able to introduce with my students is we take into contextual conversation, what is the maker identifying? What fields are they identifying themselves as working in? Where are they placing their work? And also how do we, read and receive and interact and encounter that work, bringing our own contexts and our own um, perspectives to that conversation as well. 
Laura Monjovi is um, an artist that works with historical backgrounds. So I show my students works like this. Um, she's incredible. And, you know, again, she would tell you that this is visual art. Um, and, you know, when I encountered this work and reached out to her, I was like, this is, to me, this is clearly a book. This is a room that I'm walking through that is in, in textual, in structural um, discourse with all of the histories that she's engaging with. So what is liberatory pedagogy? I draw, of course, from the work of Bell Hooks in teaching community. And in a nutshell, it's work that is concerned with the whole person. It's work that is concerned with all we bring with us to our, our context, to our circumstances, our gifts, our hopes, our losses, our compassion, our resources, where we understand and take continuous time to understand who is in the room with us, that when we share a space, we're here with a common effort and a common task. And that also makes space for how much it means to us to share this journey by making something in this space together. This is a whole lot of text that just says what I just said to you. But the most um, important piece is the, the last one at the end this presence of renewable consent. We are continuously consenting to participate. We have to make space for our community members level of participation to change over time. And we need support for our work along the way. And our work is our attention, it's our effort, it's our ideation. And by making this an explicit piece of my classroom conversation, my students, you know, often, often for some of the first time, realize that it's an asset to bring their whole self to their work, um, that we are each making space for fuller presence. And that is going to transfer and to translate and to transfigure their work because it also it does the same thing with their work. It makes space for a fuller presence. So the assignments and tasks I begin with in my creative writing classrooms are with foldables because students have uh, a lot of hesitancy, especially writers, when I say we're gonna start working with material. And so we just start folding paper because that is not an intimidating place to begin. So we begin with childhood forms like the little cootie catchers and paper airplanes, anything that they have experience with folding. And we add text. So bringing in multiple languages, uh, multiple modes, we take pictures and make technology part of this. Um, of course, altered books are a wonderful place to add in. And then we look at shape and meaning and the complexities of the structures. What happens when technology is a material? How, how are we troubling digital work by using a certain platform like Instagram? What, in what ways does that make us complicit with um, an entire global economy? And then here's some examples of what we make. Um, Object-based work, body text, fabric, scenes, handmade pieces. Um, sometimes we end up with you know, entire installations. All of these student examples I'm showing you are first time makers. They have, they have no experience with this before. And the, the end of this talk is that what we are working to focus on is to recognize that the, all of these systems are place-based learning and that we transform the book as a site of generative radical transgression that has room for these multiple presences and actively positions the art of the book as revolutionary praxis because it finally offers them space to bring their whole self to the presence. And we can talk about applications and futures as a whole group again. Thank you for being so patient with my kind of rapid fire talk. <laughs> On to you. <laughs>
It was great. Thank you very much, Nikki. Um, our last speaker is Amanda D'Amico. So I'll hand it over. A little. Hi. Hello. Um, thank you, everyone who organized so much work. And uh, I appreciate everyone getting together. Of course, my dog just woke up from his nap and will likely start barking at something outside. Um, but we'll deal with that. Um, and there's the doorbell. I'm so sorry. I knew that would happen. I just wanted to remind you all what online learning was like. Anyhow, um, I'm Amanda D'Amico. I'm in Philadelphia. Um, I teach at the University of the Arts in the MFA Book Arts program. And I also teach 2D Foundations at Tyler School of Art at Temple University. And what I wanted to talk about today was some of the ways that I approached materials with my students and um, just a general shift in how I approach them now and how I think about them um, in relation to some of the lessons that we learned during the pandemic. So both of my schools, uh, we went into quarantine during spring break, students left with the assumption they would come back and of course they didn't. So a big thing that we had to discuss as teachers was how are we gonna get our students materials, right? Um, they're at home. We remember that most things were shut down. Um, excuse me, most things were shut down. Um, our reliable places like Talis or Hollanders were closed. We had Amazon, but for various reasons, I don't want to depend on Amazon, mostly that I couldn't get students materials as quickly as I wanted them to. It was during this time that I found this website, artprof.org, which is a resource site for K through 12 educators. And a lot of what they presented was unsophisticated for college level work, but given the circumstances we were under, I took advantage of their um, paint materials suggestions, which are, uh, some of them are familiar, some of them are absurd, um, not necessarily things that I was doing with my students, but it got me to think broader about what our students had access to. Um, I will not be making toothpaste drawings or toothpaste books unless they have some content related to such a topic. But what I did get from this website was that these, these materials are all coming from the same places. They're in the kitchen, they're in the bathroom, they're outside. So this became a way for me to think about access for my students. As I moved through that um, spring 2020 semester and throughout the whole next year when I was still teaching online, what I asked myself was, what can my students buy at the grocery store? What can they get at the drugstore? What can they get at a big box store like Target or Walmart? I also wanted to ask them what they already had in their house because I did go doomsday for a moment and think, my God, I have to survive with only the materials that are left in my house in March 2020. So looking around the house, looking out in the yard, and then looking in the trash to see what we could repurpose. I began to think of these as my students' resources. There were a couple of processes that became really popular in printmaking classes, and I want to draw attention to Peshwar. Um, these are two recent um, post-pandemic, if we are post-pandemic, pieces by Haiti Kyle. Um, Peshwar is a precursor to uh, screen printing, and it can be done so beautifully uh, and delicately. And by the way, a lot of these images are your screenshots from Instagram and the web, because this is how I was learning and paying attention to what people were doing. So this is from Beth Sheehan. Beth is an artist and educator in Alabama, and she was teaching workshops and is still teaching workshops online for the Center for Book Arts. And these are images from some of Beth's Peshwar um, workshops where you can see that she repurposed acrylic paint and makeup sponges as a way to actually apply um, a medium to her stencils. It's not super sophisticated, but very accessible, right? So we can cut the stencils out of cardstock, but 
you could also have your students use junk mail, um, anything that's a heavier material, cut out your shapes, and then whatever they had around was what I was asking them to make art with. Um, crafty acrylic paints are very inexpensive, easily accessible at various stores. The cool liquid pigments I saw a lot of printmaking professors using. And I love that Beth used makeup sponges. I had some of my students also just using dish sponges as a way to apply color. Stamping was also something that um, I started to pay more attention to and talk to my students about. And these are also pre-pandemic images from a book artist, Sarah Dorman, who I think is in Missouri, but I'm not positive. I know she's in the Midwest. And Sarah had been carving one by one inch mounted linoleum blocks and then repeating them to make patterned end papers that were just beautiful. And I loved this idea. Um, I met Sarah at PBI in 2018, and we both took a class on medieval bindings. So you can see that Sarah has her block. She just used ink pads, applied that stamping all over this scrap of parchment, and proceeded with making her um, really beautiful medieval binding. Again, coming back to Beth, I think Beth just did such a great job of making things accessible to people. Um, she went right back into a beloved elementary school process, carving into potatoes and stamping them out. Um, I did this with my students, potatoes, apples, carrots, anything that was firm and flat. Um, the other thing that I encouraged my students to work with was erasers. And since the pandemic, I've seen some really beautiful eraser prints. Little pink pearl erasers are a nice size, but I also had my students carving every pencil in their house into some little shape. Um, easy carve material on the right. As stores began to open back up, this was something that I encouraged my students to use because you could print it without a press. And if they didn't have linoleum carving tools, um, all of these things could just be done with an X-Acto knife and really ink pads became one of my favorite materials during the pandemic, surprisingly. Um, and I'm not going to talk too much about her, but I just want to shout out that Sarah Matthews, our CBA president, um, is just a master at this kind of thing. And I watched so many of Sarah's videos where she's carving scraps using ink pads and producing these really gorgeous uh, printed pattern papers. So I wanna come back to um, what I laid out as you know where we get these supplies and this idea of reusing trash. I think that our students being poor college students, um, perpetually poor college students are always looking to save money and recycle in whatever way they can. And this is a store in Philadelphia called the Resource Exchange. It's a creative reuse center. And what they do is they get donations from movie sets, from artists, from all kinds of creative people. They sort the inventory, which is a really important part, and then they resell it to people. And it is incredibly accessible, very well organized, and sometimes inspiring. Pretty much all of my students are aware of this place and go there and buy things. They're not necessarily less expensive. They do have to pay for the space and the labor of the people that are there. But what this space does is that it keeps things out of the trash stream. I buy most of my workshop materials here now. Um, I go in on random days to just see what they have and if it sparks any kind of creativity in me. They may not always have the exact material that I need, but they surprise me. Um, I've gotten Davy board and uh, Hanamule paper and some, you know, really gorgeous silk and wool yarns and things like that, um, that I might not pick up otherwise, or that I might invest a lot more money in. And this way, I'm not spending, uh, I'm not contributing to a lot of commercial waste. There's another place in Philadelphia, and there's also a second location in Brooklyn called Fab Scrap. And Fab Scrap does the same thing, but more specifically, they're trying to keep material out of the fashion, uh, fast fashion stream. So fabrics, lots and lots of fabrics or um, 
clothing that's not, uh, that has been ruined in some way because it's a sample. But what I send my students to Fab Scrap for is their leather bin, which is pretty incredible because you'll find like an entire skin, but just one little piece has been cut out for, you know, that one tip of a shoe or, you know, the side of a purse. And so these are very inexpensive materials uh, accessible to students, and the students are increasingly enjoying the fact that they're being environmentally conscious. There are a lot of these places popping up. Um, the, the focus of my presentation kind of changed the more research I did, and there are a number of these places. I found them in Chicago, in Pittsburgh, in Somerville, Massachusetts, but there are also online resources. So if you do live in a smaller place, um, or a place where you don't have one of these yet, you can go on a website like Stockette. They replenish their website once a week and you can see all of the new things that have been donated and saved from the trash. And my last tip, um, I became a really big fan of DStash on Etsy. So what DStashing is, is any one of us going into our incredibly uh, fruitful paper supplies and deciding, you know what, I'm not gonna use this green paper. I'm gonna de-stash and sell it on Etsy. Um, this is just a general de-stash search, but I would, now when, I'm, when I need supplies, this is where I start. De-stash, the specific supply I'm looking for, maybe somebody's selling it, maybe they're not, but I could at least save it from somebody else's studio um, before I'm actually buying it myself. What occurred to me as I was researching for this uh, presentation was that this idea of keeping our materials out of the trash stream of um, sourcing responsibly, of upcycling, is something that is very soon going to be commonplace amongst our students. So a college, a, a standard typical college senior right now is probably 22 years old, born in 2001. The effects of climate change and the pressing urgency of climate change is going to be much stronger for these students, and it's starting immediately. Um, I visited a, a pre-primary teacher friend of mine in Manhattan a few weeks ago, and she teaches at the Blue School, and this was the pre-primary materials library. So two to five-year-olds at the school um, have access to this space. Their teachers will come up with whatever project it is that they're doing. They put out a call to parents if they have materials, can they bring them to school? The kids do their project and anything left over goes to the library. The teachers sort it. And the next time the kids wanna do a project, they ask the students to start in the resource library. What's here? What do we already have that you can use to make what you wanna make? Um, Sorting is still a big part of this because going into a pile of trash is not fun, but looking at lots of labeled boxes is so satisfying. So they sort things by um, consumables and tools and kids are able to come in and have access to these things. And what they don't find, they can request to their teachers that they buy. This idea of more peer-to-peer -peer sharing and keeping things out of the trash um, was also echoed by Aaron Sweeney, who's a book artist in New Hampshire. Aaron, like many of us, uh, did the deep cleaning of her house during the pandemic and realized she just had so many supplies she wasn't going to use. So she put them out in her driveway with big signs. And then she realized if she sorted them, organized them, people would be able to easily come and pick them up. And this idea got so popular in her town that um, the library, um, libraries in another town, other stores started to ask her if she would make these kits and bring them to these different places. They were used by kids who were doing school at home, um, parents who were trying to keep their young kids busy, bored adults who needed a new crafting project. And as this project grew, Erin did get donations but she was still trying to keep this spirit of DIY and reuse um, really active. So you can see this time capsule kit is actually a book 
uh, made of envelopes with, this had a link to a, something on the Smithsonian Library website that would show you how to make the thing. When she did a book binding kit, she couldn't give the kids alls, so she made some alls out of uh, saved corks and needles and distributed things that way. And this kind of innovation, I think, is increasingly important with our students and should be for our adults. Um, this was an art and material swap that we hosted at the Soapbox Community Print Shop in Philadelphia. And we asked artists and community members to bring books and art materials. We had about 40 to 50 people come through. This was our first in-person event at the Soapbox after we reopened, and it was a huge success. People brought really, really lovely and interesting things, and everybody went home with something new to work on. I just wanted to mention really quick some of my go-tos um, while I was teaching were this Astro Brights collection of paper because it comes in lots of colors, text weight, cardstock. You can buy it at Staples, Target, Amazon. Um, this has become my new reliable resource um, for paper. And then I just wanted to acknowledge a couple other things real quick. My new favorite all is a push pin. I use this for my college freshmen. They're very happy with it. They don't have to buy a new tool. They all want to use DMC floss. It's not great. I tried lots of things. Waxing it is a disaster. I found a little bit of moisture um, would help relax it. I also found that I couldn't deter them from using it. So I had to find a way to use it because it's cheap and lots of colors, readily available. And then these were from a course that I taught um, both online and in person with various scraps that I got from these places. I was able to teach Coptic stitching, sewing on tapes, and long stitch binding, um, all with scrapped materials. Um, and this is just to illustrate that, you know, if I want an advanced student to do something really beautifully and perfectly, we would be probably more directly sourcing our materials, but for introductory kinds of projects, these scraps that I acquired were perfect. And I was very happy with them and my students were happy with them. Um, lastly, I just wanted to show a Philadelphia artist who has been using plastic in her work. Um, Karen Viola is a member of the Philadelphia Center for the Book and she's consciously trying to keep plastic out of the waste stream and incorporating it into her books in a really lovely way that are not about the plastic, but still referencing the environment. Um, she's taking plastic bags, which are becoming obsolete, and other plastic materials and fusing them together with an iron and then cutting them out and sewing them together, which is something that Haiti Kyle has been playing with for years and years. This is uh, from Haiti's Instagram account, her tree topper from last year made out of grocery store trash. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Amanda. Um, we're, we're sort of out of time um, for questions, but I really appreciate everybody's um, uh, presentation. So let's give a, a nice round of Zoom applause to our pre presenters. It was a, a really inspiring panel. Um, so I want to give a big thank you to all the speakers and everyone who's contributed to this um, Zoom symposium. So we're we're very happy that we were able to to do a meeting with CBAA, even though we couldn't do it in person this year. But next year, next year in person. So very excited about that. Um, and before we take our break, I just wanted to give a big. Uh, Thank you to everyone who's helped with this meeting, especially um, to Rachel Simmons, who did a lot of the heavy lifting for this meeting. And also Virginia Green, who I don't know if, uh, if Virginia is here, but uh, Virginia is the one who sends out all the communications about the meeting. And so all the reminders, all the links. So we couldn't have done it without those two people. But um, especially I wanna give a huge thank you to our president, Sarah Matthews, um, who, really inspired us yesterday with her address um, and for sharing her, her personal um, stories.
but also who has um, led CBAA through this difficult time with unflagging dedication. So thank you so much, Sarah, for that.